Good morning. Welcome to Christ Community Church. This morning we're wrapping up our, our message series on belief with a message entitled Lukewarm. I, I believe this is actually one of my, my favorite of these four messages, but or maybe at least a, a close second to last week's message on, on our mission, because that was so so um, powerful with the testimony of, of, of Sherry, and, and you know, I learned so much about the, the people of Haiti, and, and um, I, I just enjoyed that a lot. That was, that was, that was good. And um, I tell you, this, this week is just, is just so practical. So practical, and, and um, I think it's because in so ma- so many ways, we all find ourselves on different levels, living our lives in this, in this cycle. You know, we, we live we live in a cycle. You, you, as, you, as you read the Bible, you see cycles continuously through the whole Bible. We we too live our lives in a cycle, a cycle of of passion for God, a zeal for God. When suddenly we find ourselves kind of like a our morning coffee. In, in, a, in a, a cooling period where there's a little bit of, of lukewarmness that begins to creep in. And, um, and so today we're going to look at the, at the Word of God where Jesus dictates seven letters to seven churches. And the last letter was to this one church, the church of Laodicea. That's the letter that we're going to look at today in Revelation chapter 3. But before we get started, I want to give you a a little bit of context behind the scripture. Laodicea is actually a really beautiful area. Much of the ruins of the city have been excavated today. Laodicea had a, had a beautiful main street that was lined with these polished um, marble columns up and down the street, both sides of the street. And on each side there were um, predominantly large homes. And so what's really interesting about Laodicea is that unlike many of the, the New Testament cities that we encounter, this was actually a very wealthy city. They, they've even uncovered ancient pipes revealing a sophisticated water system of, um, that, that included indoor plumbing. And so it was, not only was this a wealthy city, but it's also a, a highly developed city. Businesses in Laodicea were very successful. It was known for its massive theaters, its stadiums, its luxurious public baths. And, and, and so people had the best food, the best drink, and the best entertainment. What we find in Laodicea is that this was a very advanced culture. And you could say this city was like the, the Beverly Hills of our day. And yet here in Laodicea, Jesus had something very important to say. He had a message for this church in Revelation chapter 3. And he said to this very wealthy, very blessed group of people in verse 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, but because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, I have acquired wealth and don't need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Then he gives an invitation. It's often used within evangelical circles to invite people to respond to Jesus. You've probably heard it before. In verse 20 he says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. That's that's an amazing invitation. But we often get it wrong. Because he's not inviting those who are outside of the church. Jesus is actually knocking on the door of the church. He's knocking on the door because he's been locked out of the building that has his name on it. This, This is his address. And he he's walks up to the front, and he's knocking on the door. And you know, even today there are some professing churches, certain denominations that are, are rebelling against the God of the Bible. They're, and the truth is that Jesus has nothing good to say about them. And so he's knocking. And he's saying to the people of Laodicea, I know your deeds, not, not what you say you believe, but I know how you live. 
And the important thing for us to know is that there's a really big difference. There's a big difference between what we say and what we do. Jesus said, I, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other, but because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Pretty strong language there, isn't it? It's, pretty, it's, it's important that we understand the context of this. Excuse me a minute. The city of, of Laodicea was a city that was located on, on, a, on a plateau. It's a, a, a raised level of ground overlooking a um, plains. And so there's a big flat area around this higher level. So as you could imagine, fresh drinking water was a little, little scarce. And so they, they had to pipe their water in. But because they had money and because of a, a nearby mountain range, there was the possibility of getting nice, cold, fresh water. But then again, because of the distance and depending upon the ambient temperature at whatever time of year it was, there was also a great possibility of getting what would be considered just lukewarm water. And so one of the greatest complaints of the, the rich, wealthy, upscale people of Laodicea was that it was really difficult to enjoy the water. Even though they had built this great system, this very complicated aqueduct system so the water could be brought there, by the time the water reached them, it was lukewarm. And so that's the context. So we can understand that because a cold drink is good. We, we appreciate a cold drink. You know, some of you like, like iced coffee. Some, some of you like hot coffee, but you, you like it usually one way or the other. But you probably don't go to Starbucks and order a lukewarm caramel latte. <laughs> yeah. If you wait long enough, it'll eventually happen, right? But you don't go and order them. But, but, but that's what the Laodiceans always got. It was always lukewarm. And so Jesus, knowing them, knowing their culture, knowing their deeds communicates to them in a way that they would understand. He says, you, you know how you like to have a little bit of, of, of cold water with your lunch. And, and you're always complaining and you're frustrated because it's not good. Well, Jesus says, your, your church is just like that to me. Your devotion, your sacrifice, and your commitment is lukewarm. And it's not good. As a matter of fact, he says, it's repulsive. Now, I've got to tell you, this past week, I, I was grabbing some leftovers out of the refrigerator for lunch, and I found a Ziploc bag in the very back of the, the top shelf. <laughs> Scary, yeah. Inside were two hard-boiled eggs. Wonderful for my lunch, right? Just what I needed. As I pulled that bag out and looked at it, my, my stomach began to tighten up because there was this strange color. There was a potential for something really nasty if I were to open up that Ziploc on that bag. Because as most of you know, we were away on vacation the, the week before, so it, it had been there for you know since before vacation, hidden back in that corner, back in the very back, behind my bag of hot peppers. There it was. And... Um, Honestly, my hot peppers weren't in much better shape either. They got thrown out too. But uh, here's these two eggs that have been neglected. They, they were this color, not quite an Easter egg color, but a bluish, greenish color. And, and just the thought of that smell was something that, that stirred in my stomach and was repulsive. And that's what Jesus said. I, I wish you were either one. But because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. 
Now, when he says spit, this is an interesting word, but it's a Greek word that's only used one time in the Bible. And this is it. And, and it's certainly not one of those words you would find commonly used in, in theological or, or, or church circles. Because it means to, to spit or vomit. It means utter rejection or to be supremely repulsed. And so it would be like if I had opened up that Ziploc bag and taken a bite. And that's what I would have done. And that's what Jesus was saying. When you're, when you're lukewarm, when you, when you don't show any desire for me, Jesus would say. When you're indifferent, when you're, when you're self-satisfied, when you're comfortable with your life and you quit seeking me, I can't stomach that. I'm repulsed by it. Jesus says, I I'm getting the gag reflex. <laughs> he said, I'm getting the gag reflex. I, I can't tolerate it, and I'm going to spit you out. And so Jesus, in the, in the very most graphic way possible, communicates to them what it's like to be their God. Now, of course, to be a lukewarm Christian really, really can't be because that's what we'd, we'd call an oxymoron, right? You know, to, to put two different words that are, are polar opposites, words like, you know, clearly confused, alone together, a deafening silence, or maybe even government efficiency. <laughs> yeah. And so lukewarm Christian really, really can't be because they are those who, like the Apostle Paul warned about, saying in these days, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying his power, have nothing to do with them. And yet a lukewarm believer wants to be accepted by others. They want to be loved. They want to, well, actually, actually they, they fit right into our selfie-centered generation today. It's all about, you know, how many likes can you get on social media? You know, do you, do you like my picture? And yet Jesus actually said in Luke chapter 6, what sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? Woe to you when all men speak well of you. You see, a, a lukewarm believer longs for the approval of others more than the approval of God. They, they think more about life on earth than they do about eternity in heaven. They're, they're fearful of death because they're loving life. They're loving things of this world. And they, they'd rather be struggling and working for retirement or maybe in a wheelchair wearing diapers at 99 than they would be with the Lord in heaven. Things are just too good right here. They, they have things good. They're happy. And yet the Bible says, the Apostle Paul said it this way, this, this is the, the Christian perspective. He says in Philippians chapter 1, To me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You see, the lukewarm believer loves the things of this world more than the presence of Jesus. They love the things of this world more than the presence of Jesus. And honestly, they're, they're really not much different from the rest of the world. Or I, actually, I should say that they're, they're, they're no different at all. Because they, they use the same trashy talk at work. They have the same lack of morals. They raise their kids just like everybody else. They, they get divorced like just as often as anybody else. And they, they watch the same movies, listen to the same music, because honestly, they're just like everybody else. It's a, it's a comfortable, lukewarm belief. It's just hoping to get enough of Jesus to keep him out of hell. Just wanting to, to, just to get in. Looking for the promise of heaven but not wanting to go overboard. But Jesus calls this kind of person lukewarm. He says they're repulsive. They made them, make them want to throw up. And so he tells the church in verse 17, well, he gives them a little bit of advice. And he says in verse 17, he says, You say I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and don't need a thing. But you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire 
so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes so you can see. Now this is, this is an interesting thought because you know, we've often heard Jesus say, he, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But now Jesus says, I want you to see. I want you to see just how rich, wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked you really are. You see, they, they, they were very affluent. They were rich. And Jesus points out that they may be material rich, but, but spiritually, they're very poor. Because Jesus sees into their soul. He sees that there's no growth. There's no life there. They're physically clothed. Their pockets are full, but their hearts are empty. And so he tells them that they're spiritually empty. That they're, they're, they're naked. It's just as the Lord has said to Samuel. The Lord doesn't look at the things man looks at. The, the man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so you can be rich and powerful. You can be successful, educated, and still be spiritually bankrupt, blind, naked, and poor. Just lukewarm towards the things of God. And so Jesus counseled them to come to him for those true riches so that they would be clothed in his righteousness. That they would have the ointment for their eyes so they could see because they had essentially closed their eyes to Jesus becoming blinded to the fact that they were sinners that they needed a savior and so in their stuck up pride filled materialistic comfort and lifestyle they had surrounded themselves with saviors of success saviors of comfort saviors of pressure, pleasure and, and saviors of plenty and so the real issue here is that they were worshiping comfort instead of Christ. They were in a place of complacency. Where, to, where to be honest, home was a, a little bit like heaven. It, it wasn't Christ whom they lived for, but comfort they, they lived for. And Jesus comes to the church and he says in verse 19, those whom I, re, I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. I believe that's, a, that's a, a good word, an applicable word for the church today because so many of us are in positions where, honestly, we're, ne we're never rebuked. Nobody ever gets to discipline us because, you know, we're the parents. We're, we're the bosses. We're the ones who organize this. We put this together. So nobody has the liberty to say, you know, I, I love you, but we really need to talk about this. And so Jesus says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. I'm going to, I'm going to point out your flaws. I'm, I'm going to correct you. I, so I want you to be earnest and repent. And he invites them to change. Just like he invites us all to change. You know, many, many centuries ago, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, marking the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And the opening statement of, of that basically said, all of a Christian's life is one of repentance. And the truth is that the moment you stop repenting, you start growing lukewarm. If you're always defending yourself, always right, always blaming others, always judging others without judging yourself, always overlooking your own faults and failures, that's how you become lukewarm. The way we stay on fire for Jesus is through self-examination and repentance. That's where we acknowledge our sin, where we turn from it and we come back to Jesus, who said in verse 20, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. And like I said, the image here is of Jesus outside of the church, banging on the door because he's been locked out. What he had to say was too controversial. He was, he was, just, he was just too opinionated, too divisive. You know, God has called us to peace, right? And so what he had to say was, was just um, too much. They didn't want to hear what he had to say to them because they knew that he would tell them 
that what they were doing was wrong and that they should repent. And today there are denominations like that. There are churches where Jesus is just a little bit too divisive. They, they don't want people to get offended, but the bottom line is that it's all about Jesus. It's always been about Jesus, and it will always be about Jesus. The hope for people is Jesus. And so for us, Christianity is not just a lifestyle. It's not just a social club or a way of living that's, that's good for our family. Of course, it really is. But it's really about meeting Jesus, having Jesus take away our sins and giving us his righteousness, clothing us with that, those white garments. And, and it's, it's about Jesus filling us with the Holy Spirit so that we're on fire for God and that by the grace of God, we grow to become more and more like Jesus. It, that, that's what changes our lives. It changes our, our families' lives, our church life. It's, it's the grace of God in our community life. But it's all about Jesus. And so therefore, our response today should be the same as the response required of the church of Laodicea. And maybe some of you are feeling that gentle conviction of the Holy Spirit now, and you're recognizing, you know, maybe, maybe I, I've, I've believed in God, but I, I don't really know him because you're not fully committed to him. Well, today you need to know that Jesus is patiently waiting, that he loves you, he wants to come into fellowship with you, and he gave his life for you. All you need to do today is to humble yourself, tell him you're sorry, and invite him in. You see, Jesus said, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. And so it, it's your move. You don't, you don't have to get your act together, but you need to respond. You don't have to be perfect, but, but you just got to let him in. He'll come in because he accepts you. He loves you just as you are, but he won't leave you there. He'll transform you, and suddenly your sins will be forgiven, and you're no longer the same. You become a new creation in Christ. That's what, that's what the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And so you recognize that Jesus, our Savior Jesus, is still there. He's still knocking. He's still waiting. And so what we do is we, we run to the door like, a, like a, a little kid when daddy comes home from work. Right? That's what you, do. you run to him and you tell him, I need you. I, I need you in my life. I've missed you. I, I want to be close with you. And when you seek him, you will find him. If you don't know him, if you, you listen for his voice and you open up your heart to him, if your love has grown cold like the prodigal son, he's, he's ready to embrace you. You see, Jesus came to give you life and to give it abundantly. Unfortunately, we live in a world where so many people are comfortable. They're, they're happy with their faith, that, that form of religion. But I'll tell you, when you recognize who Jesus is and when you accept what he's done, that God became flesh in the person of Jesus and gave his life so that we could live. Our only reasonable response is to surrender and give all of ourselves to him. And just as Jesus gave his life for us in the same way, we give our life for him. That, that's the only reasonable response to a God that would love you that much. And can we pray together? Let's, let's pray and make application of God's word as we prepare ourselves to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Our Father in heaven, I pray in Jesus' name that by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that you would strengthen your church, that you would stir those who are lukewarm, and that you would fill us in ways that this world has fallen short and left us empty. God, we run to you, seeking you, and asking for your grace and your presence. Jesus, we want to be in a relationship with you. We want to know you and pursue you with all of our hearts. As you, as you continue praying, I'm, I'm going to ask you as, as directly as I can, those of you who understand who Jesus is and who at some point have, have committed to follow him, 
And yet right now you, you recognize there are areas of your life that, that are, are lukewarm. And the, and the Holy Spirit's convicting you. You feel that tugging on your heart. And, and so those of you who would say, I, I want that passion back. I, I want to be on fire for Jesus. I want to please him and serve him. If that's you, would you lift your hands right now? Would you be honest with God? Just respond to God and say, I, I see, I recognize. If there are those lukewarm areas, just, just lift your hand and give it to Jesus. You, you know what it is. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for all those that are, are responding to your love, to your, your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you're transforming us and you're moving us by your Spirit to, to know you more intimately. As we lift our hands and humble our hearts, we give you permission asking you to, to continue to reveal to us any area of our lives where honestly we might have been deceived, where we might have, have sold out for something less than what you want for us. And we ask for forgiveness so that the power of the Holy Spirit would stir within us, that we wouldn't be lukewarm, but that we would be on fire with a passion to please you in all that we do. Father, I thank you that because of your word there are people who are being changed because your spirit is working in this place. Your, your voice is speaking and you're transforming us into the image of your son, Jesus. Have your perfect way in us. We don't want to be comfortable anymore, but we want to walk by faith and not by sight. We want to please you in all that we do. And as we continue in that posture of prayer, we're going to transition into celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And the Bible tells us that we should examine ourselves. Not only that, but the Bible promises if we, if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Today, there are those of you who recognize that you, you might believe in God, but you're not following him. And you recognize right now that you, you need his grace, you need his forgiveness, and you, you even heard him knocking. This, this is your moment to respond, to let him in, but because you, you may not get another chance. And Jesus loves you. He's waiting to forgive you and to make you new. Those of you who recognize that you don't know Jesus, that you're not serving him, and you're not following him today, if your desire and your, your prayer is to say, yes, Jesus, come in, I want to follow you. Save me from my sins. I give you my whole life. I want to be fully devoted to you. I want to know you. I want to live for you. And today I turn from my sins. I turn toward you and say, yes, Jesus, you can have my whole life. If that's your prayer, would you lift your hands high right now? Just respond to Jesus. Lift your hands and, and tell him, yes, Jesus, I surrender to you. Yes, Jesus, I surrender. Let's all pray together as our musicians join us for our own communion song. Everybody out loud, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I believe Jesus died for me. He died for my sins. And you raised him from the dead. Make me brand new. Give me a new life. I want to know you. I want to serve you. And I want to follow you. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to live for you. Thank you for changing me. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. <laughs>